unsupervised learning and semi-supervised learning inside of TensorFlow, which all of you might know about. Uh, it's a Python deep learning framework. So just a little bit about myself uh, before we get started. Uh, I'm currently in grade 11. I'm at Gonzaga Secondary, but I also study at Athabasca University, where I'm learning a little bit about C++ and calculus. Uh, I also founded a hackathon called Ignition Hacks, which introduced youth to AI and machine learning. And once again, I also placed finalist at Hack the North 2021, uh, producing basically a speech therapy application called Viva, which ran on deep learning, Google Cloud, and a variety of other web frameworks that we made throughout that weekend. <laughs> so just in terms of what I wanted to discuss today, uh, it's mostly focused on unsupervised learning, but we wanted to get a start with uh, just the landscape of learning in general. So focusing on something that's a little bit more familiar, uh, specifically supervised learning, and then diving right into unsupervised learning with uh, basically k-means, and also uh, performing classification using the k-nearest neighbor algorithm. Then I want to dive into a little bit about uh, GANs, so generative adversarial networks, and basically produce a few uh, custom-made digits using uh, deep learning and general adversarial networks in TensorFlow. And finally, I want to discuss a little bit about uh, TensorFlow with basically sem semi-supervised learning and its applications in competitions such as uh, Kaggle and kind of noisy uh, student learning, and basically just pseudo labeling in general. So let's dive right into it. So in terms of just supervised learning, uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of us are a little bit familiar about the ideas of supervised learning. But basically, uh, oftentimes you'll have a very small amount of XY pairs. So for instance, that might be images to classes, or maybe text to classes and stuff like that. And you'll just go ahead and run your deep learning model, uh, trying to figure out some given function that will map from your X to your Y. Now, in reality, there's going to be a lot more data that is unsupervised, just your X data that you can probably web scrape and you can probably grab even just 3000 images right off the web right away in like two seconds. Now, labeling data is a little bit harder because we need to pay somebody or we need to get some other a method of converting those Xs into Ys. And that's obviously not using deep learning. That would be through a human in the loop. And so massive companies would pay thousands are basically just a lot of money and time just to actually have people hand label all of that data. And so in the end, you'll have less data in total, but you have some data set that maps from X to Y, and that is considered your supervised learning data set. Now, after you've trained your model, you actually have a few options with it. And so specifically, for just supervised learners, you'll stop right there and you might deploy your model. And sometimes you'll find some internal bias and stuff like that. But for people who know a little bit more about unsupervised learning, you might extend your model to get more performance using a technique called pseudo labeling. And that's where we dive into the realm of super uh, semi-supervised learning. And so that's where you take all of your web scrape data. So you might run some algorithm to grab all the images off of like Google images or some other like massive public data set just has all the images and like, that's been uploaded to the web or something. And you might go ahead and actually run your trained model to classify all those other images. And so you might just retrain your model on your massive data set now and get a model that works a lot better. And so that's kind of a massive Kaggle technique that's used to boost performance by maybe a few percent, but ultimately can end up winning competitions. So I know from personal experience, I participated in the Kaggle Hub Map Challenge and was able to place 29th in the world uh, just by using pseudo labeling. So I actually leveraged some of the kidneys and went ahead and actually um, ran my, uh, basically it was a segmentation model to grab more data and in total, basically uh, improve my model. I think it was by 3%, which ended up boosting my position from 100th to 29th. So just the power of pseudo labeling, it really just allows you to push your model even further. Now, before I dive into a little bit about semi-supervised learning, um, let's just quickly cover the ideas of unsupervised cluster learning. So I'm pretty sure that just like what I've been talking about a little bit before, but labels in general are pretty expensive. So you might have to be a massive company to go ahead and label all of the data that you have. So for instance, you can go ahead and web scrape all the data off the internet, but to actually go ahead and write down your data and map from X to Y, that requires a lot of human workers. And it's not only laborious, but it's also going to take a lot of time. And sometimes, and this is one of the more major applications of unsupervised learning, your data is very, very basically time sensitive. You need that data trained and used and applied to your model right away. You don't really have time for human workers to go ahead and label each of your examples before you can retrain your model. You just have to go ahead and apply it. 
And so this is where unsupervised learning comes in, where you don't have to have that human loop. You can just go ahead and train your model on the X data pairs. And so specifically in this case, sorry, my computer is lagging a little bit, <laughs> just I think it's from Zoom, but um, I'm pretty sure most of us have seen a few applications of unsupervised learning. So for instance, the classics are dimensionality reduction. So for instance, you might go ahead and reduce the dimension of an image down to something that's a little bit more compressed. So there's a few algorithms that do that. So for instance, like the JPEG compression algorithm, but sometimes you can actually go ahead and use deep learning to go ahead and compress all your images down to even something as small as 10 bytes. Just basically a vector, of, or I guess it would be 40 bytes, but you'd press it down into 10 numbers. And then from that, your model would learn some embedding space that it could use and recreate that image again. And we'll actually see that using something called an autoencoder. Another example of deep learning for unsupervised learning is the idea of clustering. So if you are a business person, in theory, you could actually go ahead and segment out your customers using unsupervised learning. And based on what other customers in that same cluster have basically been like researching and what they seem to have purchased, you can go ahead and recommend people similar products, which tends to actually work out very, very well. And Amazon uses that technique. Now, in terms of clustering, just diving a little bit deeper into that, I'm pretty sure most of us have seen the idea of KNN, which is K-nearest neighbors. But just to be clear and have everybody on, be on the same page, uh, the K-nearest neighbor algorithm is a form of basically clustering data. And so honestly, it's purely mathematical. And the idea is to start off with random centroids. So you might say that, oh, my data might have five groups. And so you'd plot down your X centroids in just random locations to start. Now, this is where the machine learning comes in. Basically, you would, from every single other data point inside of your X pair, you would then go ahead and map that to the clearest, the, to the nearest centroid. And so you would say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and recluster my data. And so in this case, you might end up with three red dots and four blue dots, like six green dots or something like that. Now, the issue is that your initial centroids will not be perfect. And that's the basics of machine learning in general. Your starting position will never be good. So how can we go ahead and actually improve that? We recompute our centroids by finding the middle point inside of all of our unsupervised data. And so in this case, you would go ahead and compute a new centroid, which is step three. And by repeating that process, like iteratively, just continuing to create new centroids, uh, essentially clustering and basically going to the middle again, you can actually create nearly perfect centroids most of the time. Now, obviously, this depends on your initialization, but that's kind of the basics of unsupervised learning, or in this case, it would be KNN algorithm. So some things that people haven't really seen before is actually, we can actually apply the Canon algorithm to do classification. And so it sounds crazy to begin with. And my diagram isn't exactly perfect. I made that through one of the neural network generator for like papers, and it's not exactly used for KNN. So it doesn't look perfect. But the idea is, is that we can actually use deep learning plus our regular KNN algorithm to go ahead and classify images. In this case, I'll use MNIST as our example, using K-nearest neighbors. And so how we go ahead and do this is we would start with an autoencoder. And using this autoencoder, we can actually create an embedding space for each of our images. So for instance, the number nine might get mapped down into a little bit more of a longer embedding that essentially you would start off with your 28 by 20 image, which is what MNIST gives you to begin with. You would then go ahead and down convolute it. So basically you just use a regular convolutional neural network and you'll map that down to your embedding space. And so in my case, I use an embedding space of hundred just so we could capture enough data. And then you would essentially train it to begin with, with the task of autoencoding, which is the idea to take an image or some sort of data, compress it down, and then essentially expand it back to the original form. And through doing that and iteratively improving your deep learning model, let's just say through a convolutional neural network or even just a dense autoencoder, both would work for MNIST, this is just an example, but basically through trying to improve it slowly by making sure that your end result is equal to your initial beginning image, you're essentially going to learn in that middle spot where you've compressed all of your embeddings down into one space, you're going to learn an embedding that's going to be pretty good. So for instance, number nine might point in one direction while the number eight will point into another. Now, the importance is that if you write the number eight in a different way, and ideally your neural network will be able to point in a vector that is in the same direction because it's able to understand what kind of, uh, what kind of signs inside the image the number eight represents.
And so through compressing all of our images in the MNIST data set into that embedding space, we've captured some important information through just simple unsupervised learning. So that's our dimensionality reduction already in action. We've taken an autoencoder, just taken the X values, and we've learned some information about it. Now let's go ahead and extend that even further and pop on a KNN classifier where we can go ahead and learn that embedding space that the autoencoder has created. And so in that case, you would pop on your KNN classifier, say I have 10 nodes because there's 10, uh, there's 10 digits that we can learn, and then basically have the KNN algorithm run and find the centroids. And so through doing that, now let's say you have a new image and you've trained the entire system. Now two unsupervised models combined together, you can go ahead and run your images through and you can actually get a classification result. Now, obviously, it's not going to pop out the number nine or something like that from your images because it doesn't even know what the Y label is. But the number nine, no matter how it's written, if you've trained an ideal model, it will end up in the same cluster, effectively performing classification using unsupervised learning. And so in this case, our metric, unlike the regular accuracy, you would do something called normalized mutual information, which is basically where you can map your regular labels that you would have had for testing to whatever class la cluster labels you've created with your unsupervised model. And essentially, it is similar to accuracy. It will give you a value from zero to one, depending on how close those clusters are. And so our goal is basically to calculate how close our clusters are to the true labels. Now, I've popped into the chat uh, when I started essentially a few Colab notebooks. Uh, unfortunately, due to the time, I won't be able to run through them all. So I just have a few images of what the results will be. And so on your own time, if you're interested, you guys can actually go ahead and run them and you'll get similar results. But effectively, that would be my first system on the, on the left. You'll see my first autoencoder where I've effectively taken our MNIST data sets and my MNIST images, and I have... Um, effectively compress them down into some embedding space. And you can see the recreated image is a little bit more blurry, but it ultimately captures the value of what, what it means to be the number two. And so when you run it through the autoencoder, you will get something similar back. And now I've popped on in the image in the top right, essentially a new k-means classifier. And so it clusters into 10 and then it makes predictions. And from my original, just simple k-n algorithm that I ran, it actually had huge improvements compared to the other, just because of how it's able to capitalize on the embedding space. So now that I've dived a little bit into the Canon algorithm, uh, let's go ahead and dive into GANs. So GANs or general adversarial networks is another powerful unsupervised technique used to essentially create new images and create new data to improve your models further. Now, why would we even use GANs? I'll skip that slide and come back. But in general, for things like Kaggle, sometimes you won't even have the data. Sometimes it's proprietary. And so you can't just go ahead and web scrape for millions of images. Sometimes you only have certain types of images that you can learn on. And so if it's, especially if it's proprietary data, it's going to be very, very difficult. So sometimes you won't actually have that kind of data to begin with. You will have proprietary data that, like, let's just say it's not publicly on the internet. And so GANs provide us with a very, very powerful method to create new images and create new data to train on. And so, for instance, you might create a new larger test data set to then go ahead and pseudo label, which I'll dive into at the very end. And so now that we've addressed why we might actually use a GAN, what even is a GAN or a general adversarial network? Basically, you're having a fight between two neural networks. You have a generator who is the artist. Basically, the generator will be creating its new image similar to an autoencoder. It will start off with some random noise and create an image out of it. Let's just say it's a cat. And so through training and fighting with this discriminator, which is the art critic saying, is this image real or not? You can take some sample of data that you already have and the data that the GAN or the generator has created. And ultimately, the generator's goal is to be able to fool the discriminator, to create some sort of image that the discriminator cannot even tell that is fake data. And so the discriminator's job at this point is to be able to differentiate between, between the two. And so at this point, you're solving two optimization problems. The generator is trying to fool the discriminator, and the discriminator is trying to get it accurate. And so for that reason, um, GANs are typically considered what's called unstable because sometimes basically nothing will learn because the discriminator and the generator have settled in. But if you're able to train with a very, very effective model, which is why uh, typical GANs networks exist, like Big GAN or like um, 
different kinds of GANs like uh, DC GAN and stuff like that. There's a whole bunch of algorithms and models that exist. But um, basically, you have to construct one that's nearly perfect because when those two neural networks are basically battling each other, trying to figure out um, the discriminator trying to figure out if images are real or not, and um, the generator trying to create new images that look real, essentially, sometimes you'll end up collapsing, and that's called GAN mode collapse. And so ultimately, we're trying to create a model that will train and generate new images without collapsing. So you might ask, normally, I'm used to solving one optimization problem, just how can I get from X to Y? But with GANs, we actually have two because the generator is trying to create new images, and that's a separate optimization problem. And the discriminator is trying to do the classic task of just classifying it. And so we actually go ahead and create two loss functions and optimize on two different things. And so how we go ahead and do this is that the generator has a loss function that essentially is split in two. Number one, uh, basically, the actually, I think I flipped that around by accident, but um, the discriminator has the job of classifying between the real and the fake images. This is your classic classification algorithm. So I think I mixed these up by accident, <laughs> but I'll, I'll fix those slides after. But um, in general, it's trying to figure out which one's real and which one's not. And so that might be through just binary cross entropy, just the standard loss function where the real one should be classified as one and the fake one should be classified as zero. Now the GAN or the, uh, sorry, the generator should be trying to fool the discriminator. And there's only one real metric and it's how accurate was the discriminator to begin with. And so, Basically, if the fake images, so in this case, Y fake, was classified as one, the generator will suffer no loss because that's what it was supposed to do. And so basically, the generator is trying to optimize on how much the, the discriminator was failing. And so by creating two optimizers in TensorFlow, in this case, you would go ahead and optimize on both. So you would use apply gradients, but you'd have two optimizers, one optimizing the generator and one optimizing the discriminator. Now, in terms of the notebook, again, that's in the chat, so you guys can go ahead and run that. Um, I'll have some images too. You'll see that as my generator and discriminator are slowly training, we start off with this kind of random images. So this is after I trained once. That's epoch one. Effectively, you'll see that it's kind of random noise. These aren't really numbers. You can kind of see rough shapes. But by the end, when I'm trained by, I think it was 50 epochs. I didn't train it for too, too long. But uh, you'll see that they're actually recognizable to a human. That one's the number 9, 6, 2, 8, 4, 3, 3, 2. The images aren't obviously perfect because I just took a simple dense model. So you'll see that there's a convolution and then there's just a few dense layers, but it's able to generally learn what it means to be a number and the generator is able to somewhat fool the discriminator. Now you'll see that I have actually created two different optimizers inside of the top left image, our top right image. Uh, basically there is one that is going to be uh, the, basically the discriminator's gradients and the discriminator's optimizer. And there's another one that says generator's optimizer and the, genera the generator's gradients. And so unlike custom loops that you might be doing with TensorFlow before, um, you're actually going to have to create two gradient tapes because both of them will be creating gradients for the separate optimization task. And they'll both be training at once. And so you can kind of see how it's a little bit unstable. But one thing that you definitely want to see while you're printing out your losses, while you're testing and debugging your neural network, is that you actually don't want to see either of the losses go down to zero. Because that means one of your models have collapsed and, vic and basically won over the other. For instance, if your discriminator has achieved zero loss, that basically means that at this point, your generator has given up because your generator at this point cannot create images that have fooled the discriminator and the discriminator is perfect every single time. So it has nowhere to learn and the generator is kind of just struggling. What you want to see is that they're both kind of fluctuating, but in general, they're both going down a little bit. So effectively, you're trying to make sure that they're both training at the same time. And the only real way to test whether or not your GAN is truly learning is basically by testing, by seeing the images themselves, which is why GANs are so particularly hard to train because you can't just simply use something as simple as like maybe just loss functions. And so in this case, you can see that I basically trained it by looking at the images, but for more complicated tasks, you'll actually have to test more often just to make sure that at one point you can tell which epochs it collapsed and how can I adjust the model to reflect and basically improve my model after my GAN collapsed. And so that's definitely a technique that I'd be happy to discuss on Slack on just different techniques to make sure that my GAN doesn't collapse. But in general, using stuff like Wasserstein loss, uh, I didn't use it in this case. I just used a simple uh, uh, least squares loss. But there's a variety of different GAN losses that will improve stability in order to improve your GAN's performance. And so you'll see that state-of-the-art GANs use incredibly complex models and incredibly complex loss functions just because they're simulating such large images. At this point, I think some of them can produce 3,000 by 3,000 pixel images without collapsing, which is absolutely amazing.
So now with the last few minutes, uh, I think I have eight minutes left, uh, is the idea of semi-supervised learning. And so this is one of those things, if you guys are Kagglers, um, is one of the most important concepts that you need to know if your goal is to win. So in general, if you just use the train data, most people know how to do that. Most people on your Kaggle platform or your Kaggle competition will already know how to apply a basic model to train a neural network and achieve very decent performance. So for instance, you might go on to like, uh, in this case, I'll use the Kaggle Hub Map Challenge because I participated in it, but you might train just a very simple a segmentation model like UNet or something like that, using like an efficient net backbone or something, you might just train a very, very simple CNN that runs for segmentation and you'll train it on the X kidneys that you have. Now, most people already know how to do that and will be able to achieve the results that you've already gotten. Now, how can I go above and beyond and improve and actually place? And this is where semi-supervised learning and effectively using pseudo labels comes in. So there's a few different semi-supervised learning techniques. And so number one, you have something called pseudo labeling, and that's almost one of the most important ones. Now, another really relevant one that has come in recently with uh, something called efficient net and efficient at V2 is the idea of noisy student training. And I'll dive into that first. Now for very special applications, there's also something called consistency training. That's basically where you want to make sure that your model doesn't really have too, too much bias, meaning that it's able to actually work with um, a variety of different data, whether it's augmented, whether it's reflected and stuff like that. It's able to basically work with all the data augmentations and it doesn't have too, too much bias. And so I'll quickly explain that. It's called the two model or like the II model. Effectively, you would train a model. And after you're doing that, you're going to train with a regular uh, regularization loss. So for instance, for one of your X pairs, you're going to pass in an augmentation that might reflect the image. And the other one might like rotate the image by 90 degrees. Now in general, a good CNN, depending on the application, should be able to classify both as the same thing. Now to ensure regularization, you'll actually stop it right there. You won't take the class labels, you'll take the embeddings and you'll go ahead and compute a least squares or something like that to make sure that they actually get the same embedding, meaning they've seen the same thing out of that image. And so that just basically helps out in terms of making sure that your, your model is completely the same and can do the same thing, even when it's uh, augmented data. So that's important for Kaggles and has been used in previous Kaggles to win competitions, just to make sure that your private data, some, something that might be a little bit different than your public data, your model will still perform equally as well. Now, something that's become really, really relevant is the idea of pseudo labeling. And so pseudo labeling has always been kind of an amazing technique, and it has actually won a variety of different competitions in Kaggle and other applications. And so your standard and classic example is the Santander customer transaction challenge, where pseudo labeling was the number one factor that boosted the number one winner by 0.0005% accuracy. And they managed to pull away with $25,000 from that Kaggle challenge. Now, other ones that have also won with pseudo labeling include like the TGS salt uh, segmentation challenge, global wheat ob object detection and stuff like that. But um, ultimately, pseudo labeling is almost essential to apply when you're Kaggling or even working with real world data to make sure that your models work the, be uh, work the absolute best that they can. And so, uh, yes, David, I will post my slides. I'll probably post it uh, in the chat if I have time. And if not, I'll post it inside of the talks channel inside of the Slack. Um, in terms of how pseudo labeling actually can work, um, there's three main techniques that you might use. And I've actually drawn them with an arrow to show which one's typically the best. Now your classic example that most people actually know how to do is the idea of, um, the classic example is the idea to basically train your model supervised and then go ahead and amass your pseudo label. So just predict on the test data of whatever you have access to, maybe you've web scraped it, combine the two data sets and train again, but train the exact same model and just fine tune it on the pseudo labels. Now, as although this is the simplest, you can do it in one shot, um, this technique typically performs the worst out of all of them. Now, the classic uh, technique that most people do is the idea of training and restarting again before training on your pseudo labels. So you might train a preliminary model, go ahead and pseudo label, and then combine your two data sets, refresh your model from image net weights or whatever you started with, and train it all on the entire data set again. And so by doing that, your model can actually learn a little bit more than perhaps just fine tuning, where it's just learning a little, little bit because your learning rate at that point is so small. Now, something that's a little bit more powerful and is should be used very situationally is entirely pre-training on pseudo labels. You might go ahead and train your models on the supervised data, predict your pseudo labels, 
and then go ahead and pre-train your model. So you'd start completely from random initialization, maybe from Xavier or initialization or Gora, but you would just start completely from scratch. And then you'd, instead of starting from something like ImageNet, which has already been trained and you have like your pre-trained weights and you're just transfer learning, you'll actually transfer learn on your pseudo labels, which have a lot more data uh, hopefully your X data should have a lot more data than your, uh, sorry, your unsupervised data that you had to pseudo label is should be a lot more. And so you'll pre-train all on that pseudo data and then go ahead and train again. And you'll fine tune on your supervised data, which should be the most accurate. And so that technique can actually work the best and has won many Kaggle competitions, but it should be used very, very situationally. Now, just a few tips and tricks before you guys go ahead and app, uh, actually go ahead and apply pseudo labeling into your real world like applications. Um, make sure that your pseudo labels actually represent the actual data set. Um, pseudo labels can sometimes not be as representative as you might expect. And so if you end up training and pseudo training is the classic term on data that doesn't actually represent just like anything, like even with supervised learning, your model won't do well and you'll actually lose performance. Furthermore, if you ever have the opportunity to use soft pseudo labels, meaning rather than having like, let's just say your model predicts 0 0.9 instead of the hard one, uh, use those because it typically teaches the model more because you'll be able to figure out which models confuse the teacher compared to which models have just been confidently thresholded. So soft super labels typically work a lot better, but um, they're situational once again, because it's sometimes tough to integrate that into your training pipeline. And furthermore, uh, sometimes you might need multiple rounds of pseudo labeling. You might need to train the model, create another one and retrain it and then do it again. And so sometimes you might train three or four times and slowly see diminishing results, but still improving results on your private data set. And so it's kind of just an ability uh, to do multiple rounds of pseudo labeling. Now, my only concern with that, and again, it should be used situationally, is because you might overfit on the pseudo data set. And so make sure not, like you might overfit on some of your data just because you're retraining on the same data set again and again and again, and your errors might get propagated if you do it a little bit incorrectly. So again, um, Makes like sometimes errors might get propagated throughout the networks. And so it's again, situational. Now, the last thing I want to cover because I'm running out of time is the idea of noisy students. And so noisy student training is something that was applied to efficient net and efficient v 2 And it's another super uh, semi-supervised technique where they basically train a simple teacher model that then learns your pseudo labels. And then you'll train an even larger student. So the student will be technically supposed to be smarter than the teacher. Now, this is pretty classic to train again, but to use an entirely new model and apply a bunch of noise to the data, basically the student was able to learn a lot more general features, achieving a lot better results and state-of-the-art results at the time. So with that, um, thanks PyData for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, if you have any other questions, uh, I think, I'm not sure if I have any other time, but uh, feel free to leave it in Slack and I'd be happy to answer. Thanks so much.